This building at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, Washington, D.C., is the most important house in the nation. Symbol of America's executive power, it is also a home a home for those 34 families throughout history whose head is the President of the United States. Like any American home, this house has seen personal triumph and tragedy. It has known joy, frustration, and heartbreak, and it has, over its 168-year span, witnessed romance. Starting with the administration of James Monroe, eight presidential daughters were married while living in the mansion. On six of these occasions, the daughters have chosen the White House itself as the scene for the wedding. The last time it happened was 53 years ago, when President Wilson's daughter, Eleanor, was married in the Blue Room. These occasions are so rare, it can truly be said such events happen but once in a lifetime. Will you trace for us just how your courtship began and when you realized that it was serious? Well, to the first part of your question, I really don't quite know when our courtship began. Chuck and I have played bridge a lot together. We didn't play as partners, actually. He was usually somebody else's partner, but that's really how we met over a bridge table. And then later in the summer, we started double dating with my roommate who was visiting me at the time. And that is really how our courtship began. The, uh, the outward uh, physical beauty is one of the first things that, that any man notices about a girl. Later on, uh, you obviously can't uh, establish a relationship on, on this alone, and uh, uh, just an opportunity to, to know and to, uh, to understand her better. She has a, she's a very, very keen mind, a very, very thoughtful person. Well, he has his sense of humor, a great love of life, and a lot of, uh, lot of energy, sometimes I think more than I have. We're both fairly serious and fairly quiet. We have a lot in common. We arrived at the decision mutually. In other words, it wasn't really a spur-of-the-moment thing uh, on my part. Uh, uh, we'd gone through quite a bit of very thoughtful discussion, and uh, we decided that uh, we were right for each other and uh, that we would get married. And then later on, uh, I went through some of the, uh, the usual formalities associated with uh, popping the question. On the 10th of September, the engagement became official. The parents of the bride-to-be announced that their daughter, Linda Bird Johnson, would be wed to Captain Charles S. Robb of the United States Marine Corps. The wedding would take place in December in the White House. A courtship that had begun quietly, confided only in family and intimate friends, was now spotlighted in the national news. It would be a long time before Chuck and Linda would again know the quiet moments they had shared during the summer of 1967. The prenuptial round of festivities was launched in Washington with a black tie dinner dance. The hosts were friends of the bride for many years, Nell and Jack Height. There are those, heaven knows, didn't think he'd propose, but one night he asked for her hand. But before you get to wed a White House resident, the chap has got to check it with the president. And the fact is everything tonight is thoroughly Linda. Let us drink a toast to her everything tonight is romance and bliss. And we wish the most to her. The press didn't hear it first until it was set. Cause Chuck had to clear it first with the whole darn cabinet. Everything tonight.
tonight is thoroughly Linda. May we say specifically, no two lovers look so happy as this. I mean as terrifically, it's just like a fairy tale that came true and how. So beat the drums, cause here come Linda Bird and her captain. Chucky boy, everything tonight is bubbly wine. Isn't Chuck a lucky boy? And soon, one day again, just picture the scene. Grandpa, LBJ again with a newborn boy, Marine. And they sure won't need to hire babysitters. Not because it's status like it's a job the Johnsons think is just fine. And they work for gratis like let's meet on that happy day when they take the vow. So beat the drums, cause here comes Linda Bird and her captain. Oh. Stately Washington Club was the setting for Linda's first shower. Hostess, Linda's close friend, Marta Ross. The guests were friends Linda had known from the cabinet, school days, career circles. Bridal showers are a uniquely feminine innovation, and this one particularly so, for the accent was on lingerie. Oh, this is for Miss Summers. How sweet, sweet. Oh, boy. And how sexy it is. <laughs> when this girl enough for me to wear one. <laughs> Julie took me seriously. I told her I needed something to wear on my head. <laughs> King size for, for pen curls. <laughs> oh, this is for Ms. Mesta. Ooh. Oh, boy. Oh, look. Like a little short. Oh, isn't that cute? Look. Oh, I love that. Look at the back, how it goes down the back. Isn't that pretty? Just beautiful. Hardly wait to work. After a weekend of parties and showers in her honor, Linda thought she was going to spend a quiet Sunday afternoon at the home of Captain and Mrs. Gerald Giles. She soon learned that not all prenuptial events are advertised on the social calendar. Open. I love open. Okay. <laughs> no, all right. Well, we came in, and the first thing we saw 
was Julie's car that said, My man is a Marine. Marine. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't spot mine out there, did you, Linda? The well, one? I saw two cars, and, and someone, I didn't see. Because yeah, we pulled up in front. We were in, I was oh, scared to no. death you'd spot that one. No, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't know one. Good. Oh, good. Sweet. Yeah. Isn't that lovely? Oh, do you think, you think I dare oh. use them? <laughs> yeah. Well, good, now. Chuck doesn't know this, but you know, I know oh, nothing about domesticity. Oh. I mean, I'm so <laughs> far out. <laughs> I don't know how bad it can be. With Linda caught up in the spirit and fun of her first showers, Chuck whiled away the hours quietly pursuing one of his favorite pastimes. a reception by Justice Tom Clark and Mrs. Clark, who have known Linda since she was born. The setting was the Saldrave Club, and the emphasis was on nostalgia. In an unforgettable evening, Linda and Chuck turned tables on their hosts, leading the guests in an impromptu celebration of the Clark's 43rd wedding anniversary. Justice and Mrs. Clark were not the only eyes of Texas on Linda. A few days later, at her Kenwood home, Mrs. Willard Deason welcomed Linda to a Texas-style shower. Bill Deason is Linda's godfather. Co-hosting the colorful event was Mrs. J.J. Pickle, who's wife of the representative of Texas, who now serves President Johnson's old congressional district. As Linda spent a carefree afternoon sharing a few light-hearted moments with old Texas friends, Chuck was buckling down to more serious prenuptial activities. On the 17th of November, a small group of intimate friends gathered at the White House at the invitation of both Linda and Chuck. The festivities were in honor of another couple who had already taken their vows 33 years ago. I've been very fortunate to have parents who show their affection. One instance, I remember when I turned 
I think it was my 20th birthday. My father sent me um, a very pretty little basket of flowers, spring flowers, because my birthday's in March, with a note. And my father hasn't written me too many handwritten notes. I wish I had more of them, but this one was particularly sweet, saying that so many days ago you made me one of the happiest men in the world. And that day he also sent my mother an identical basket of flowers with a note with the same idea. It, it did have that same feeling. Thank you so much for uh, you know, giving us our first child. And I thought it was a terribly sweet thing. And he, he's a very romantic man. He does it on impulse. That's what I think the spirit of marriage and the, their philosophy. I think it's a thing every day that changes. It's in no means static. It's not what you think it's going to be. I think it's changing. I think you have to have your own work and your own interests, like mother's beautification, as well as trying to be a partner with his, as I think she does very well. I think that's always been their philosophy, and I'm very happy to say that this November they celebrated their 33rd, so they must have something. <laughs> Private moments are few and far between. The marriage of a president's daughter is so rare, the event so intriguing, that the public seizes upon every facet of the bride and groom's activities, their hopes for the future, their outlook on life. You're both too energetic, uh optimistic young people, but it uh, can be a brutal world. I think anyone, uh, just before they get married, has to think about what's ahead. Do you, do you think about that? Yes, but I'm not basically optimistic. I'm basically melancholy. Chuck, do you consider yourself melancholy? I think both of us are, are, are very serious. Uh, we like to look at the, the brighter side of life, but at the same time, uh, we understand uh, uh, the, the ramifications of so many of the things that, that are taking place and things that, that we do. and. Uh, the, uh, the times in which we live. The time in which Chuck and Linda live demands much of its young people. But the obligations of a man in uniform are only a reflection of the greater commitment and responsibility of the nation itself. Since America's founding fathers stepped ashore, there were men ready and willing to take up the cause. Over the years, many of these men sallied forth from the Marine barracks at 8th and I. The evening parade, a tradition of the Corps, is an echo out of the past, a reminder of the days when the nation's finest fought pirates off the shores of Tripoli, and a salute to the brave men of today. basically an infantry officer uh, and I, I think one of the most rewarding and challenging uh, assignments for any infantry officer at the uh, company level is to have command of a rifle company in combat. I'm sure I'd be scared like all the wives of our men serving us around the globe. But Chuck wants to go. He feels very strongly about it. And I'll just have to have faith in him. For Linda, the swirl of parties and luncheons continued providing no small challenge to the hostess as far as menu planning was concerned. How many festive meals can a prospective bride handle before it begins to show on the waistline? The secret, Mrs. McNamara knows, 
go light on the calories and heavy on the bright colors. The wife of the Secretary of Defense invited Linda and Mrs. Johnson to a special luncheon and shower given by the cabinet wives and their daughters. The pre-wedding round of parties had been launched in Washington, and now it was time for Texas to give it some momentum. On the 24th of November at the exclusive Dallas Club, Chuck and Linda were the guests of honor at a dinner given by Mr. and Mrs. Warren Woodward, who are longtime family friends. The psychedelic decorations in Warry Lynn Smith's front yard may not typify San Antonio, but they did set the stage for her colorful poolside party. Wari Lynn, Linda's maid of honor, demonstrated that Texas is not all blue skies and white caliche. In fact, some of the prairie gets downright abstract. Chuck also found that Texas is no place to escape the watchful eye of his future father-in-law. It was a busy Texas weekend filled with dinners, parties, and dances in their honor. Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, and to cap it off, a kitchen shower in Austin. Linda left some room for doubt as to her ability to cope with the various kitchen accessories she received. I don't really know how to cook, but necessity is the mother of invention. And so I'm sure that I'll learn enough to keep Chuck from starving before he goes to Vietnam. And then hopefully when he gets back, he'll be so hungry that he'll like whatever I fix him. When Chuck and Linda returned to Washington, they received a different kind of reception. A record snow had transformed the nation's capital into a somewhat premature Christmas setting. The weather may have put a damper on Chuck's football, but the festivities were not slowed in the least. For Linda, the passing of November had brought not only record snows and early Yule logs, but the solemn realization that she would soon be leaving the home where she had spent the last four years. She and Chuck bid farewell to the dozens of staff members who keep the White House machinery moving smoothly. Not only do they make the President's house function as the seat of executive power, but they also ensure that it serves as a home for his family. this time at Glass House, overlooking the Potomac. Chuck and three other aides were soon to be out of circulation as far as the White House duty roster was concerned, and some 26 of their fellow aides and their guests took the occasion to say goodbye. Before Chuck's proposal to Linda, few people had ever heard of a social aid, and fewer still had any knowledge of what the job entailed. Linda, perhaps, summed it up best. One of the things they have to do is make people who feel ill at ease, feel at ease. And I think there are a lot of people who come to the White House who are a little apprehensive. The House awes them, and 
think that's what the social aides hope to do, is to make them feel a little bit more at home, to extend a little of the hospitality of, of the first family to the guests. And of course, naturally, I'm very partial to what Chuck has done, and how he's extended the hospitality. On four occasions, starting in 1842, the East Room has provided the backdrop for a White House wedding. In each case, the task was the same, to transform the stately hall into a proper setting for the marriage ceremony. And in each case, the planners and workmen had to contend with the problems unique to the time and the circumstance. Alice Roosevelt and Jesse Wilson might have recognized today's East Room, but not the strange equipment being installed to record the historic event. Even making allowances for style and individual taste, the elegant appointments and rich tradition of a White House ceremony have remained constant since the wedding of the first presidential daughter, Mariah Hester Monroe, in the year 1820. The gift of a magnificent silver tea and coffee service was one of the highlights of a memorable evening, an evening that was laced with an international accent. The Dean of the Diplomatic Corps, Ambassador Sevilla Sacasa, presented the handsome Chantilly pattern service as a gift from the world's ambassadors to Washington. Receiving the diplomatic corps during the early years of the presidency was a relatively simple matter. In the administration of John Adams, six missions were accredited to the new republic. Today, along with their hosts, who were Ambassador and Mrs. Harriman, Chuck and Linda discovered that the number has grown somewhat. As a matter of fact, the ranks of the diplomatic corps have swelled to 117. Washington and Texas had honored Linda and Chuck with formal receptions, intimate parties, colorful showers. And now, their social calendar revealed one upcoming event that did not seem to fit in any category.
Actually, Chuck's fellow social aides dreamed the whole thing up. Under the rollicking organization of Lieutenant Junior Grade Brian Lamb, they brought to life history's most famous lovers. On hand were such comfortably classic couples as Anna and the King of Siam, as well as 20th century's Bonnie and Clyde. <laughs> it's wheeze for that extra energetic ounce. Diamond Jim Brady and Lillian Russell. Mm. <laughs> Hope someday to get my picture on the back side of the box. Hey, we gotta meet the guy I thought it was gonna be made on Friday, but your father forgot about this and he wants to make a special occasion, so. Uh -huh. So the group here can kind of begin before Monday comes around. I thought I'd read this little announcement. It says here for the press. And uh, it says the president, in a surprise move, today named Captain Charles Bob to replace retiring General Bob Sam Green. All right. As Commandant of the Marine Corps. Isn't it wonderful when you can recognize talent? <laughs> I think both of us are, are, are very serious. We understand the, the ramifications of so many of the things that, that are taking place. I, I would say both of us could be described uh, on, on the serious side of the spectrum as opposed to the, uh, the, the completely gay and carefree. I'm basically melancholy. I think both of us are, are, are very serious. We're both fairly serious and fairly quiet. I, I would say both of us could be described uh, on, on the serious side of melancholy. As the parties and preparations led Chuck and Linda down to the final few days before the ceremony, gifts were pouring in from friends and well-wishers across the world. The 7th of December was actually two evenings taking place simultaneously. First, in a quiet gathering in the White House, Linda honored her bridesmaids. On the agenda, along with lots of reminiscing, were the antics of Linda's nephew, Baby Lynn. At the same time, at the Army Navy Club, Chuck's friends, fellow Marines and future father-in-law, were toasting his last two days of bachelorhood. And wishing Chuck the best of everything to describe, because he deserves it, and I'm sure he'll get it. And at this time, I'd like to ask you to join me in a toast to the groom. A toast to the groom, and discretion to you, his bachelor friends. <laughs> Providing our good friend Chuck Robb with such a wonderful bride. To the president. To the president. I'm glad that you gave me an excuse, a legitimate excuse, for a night out. <laughs>
that strength to Chuck and many happy years ahead of him and to uh, that noble group that constitute the United States Marines. This night was so special, Chuck's friends spared no expense. Talent was sought from the highest levels of government. A former Marine private, now serving as chief of protocol, headed the program. From the bastions of Milwaukee to the old North Portico, with a minimum of talk, he stole the whole darn show. As alert as any eagle, yet not devoid of soul, he befriended every beagle and moved on toward his goal. <laughs> he stalked the rosy garden with firm and steady pace. He even begged her pardon when they met face to face. Although the goal was far away, he determined to pursue it. A true Marine, he'd never say, why not let George do it? <laughs> so like Caesar, this young captain came and conquered what he saw. Now he's proud to claim the titled fame of United Son-in-Law. Seems like it was just yesterday when a lady in white uh, attending the door at Garfield Hospital showed us a very small object in a very pink blanket, and she was pinker than the blanket. And I can still feel tonight the wonder that I felt on that very incredible night in March. And I think it's a feeling that comes over every father with his firstborn. And that is, this is, what life is really all about. may begin quietly, privately, quite apart from the public eye. But the wedding itself takes on an entirely new dimension. Whether the bride's father is a Monroe, Grant, Roosevelt, Wilson, or Johnson, the wedding arrangements comprise a mammoth logistics operation.
each of these preparations, no matter how small or how detailed, becomes in its own way an important part of the wedding, which in itself is an important part of White House history. So much so, in fact, that few details escape the notice of the 500 reporters and photographers assigned to the wedding. With the wedding only two days away, control of the infinite number of arrangements seems to revolve more and more around two people, the social secretary, Bess Abel, and the Episcopal minister who will perform the ceremony, Canon Gerald McAllister of San Antonio, Texas. The whirl of prenuptial parties ended as it had begun, in Georgetown, under the sign of the Indian King. This particularly festive and intimate evening was a special offering from Chuck's parents, Mr. and Mrs. James S. Robb of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm very grateful for the generosity of the Robb family and the, very, the fact that they included me this evening. In fact, I'm very grateful to the entire Rob family. It has given us much more than a son to share and a son to love. We have also been blessed with Trini and David and Wick. <laughs> and we're very happy and proud to claim them all. I guess it's natural, and I suppose that all fathers uh, worry a little bit about the men who go out with their daughters, and of course I'm no exception. But the job that I hold uh, does have certain advantages. <laughs> <laughs> They're temporary, I realize. <laughs> but, uh, Chuck, I'm going to give you a very special wedding present tonight, and I want to do it here in the presence of your family and your friends. And I'm now going to proceed to tear up in your presence all the Secret Service reports. <laughs> the courting period. <laughs> that is the period when uh, you lost interest uh, in leading us down the stairway and just uh, being a bridge partner. And you started uh, spending your weekends at Whiskey Beach. 
This first report stop starts out Saturday, 2 p.m., completed Sunday, 3 a.m. <laughs> Top secret, stamped, Whiskey Beach. <laughs> Chuck, here's all your bachelor past reduced to a bunch of wedding confetti. <laughs> this has been a delightful experience for us all this week, and particularly this has been a very pleasant evening for Ms. Johnson and me. Our hearts are filled with many memories. Our chests uh, swell with pride, uh, but the eggs come up in our throat as we approach uh, seeing uh, our little one, our firstborn, walk away with someone else. It seemed like it was just yesterday when a lady in white uh, attending the door at Garfield Hospital showed us a very small object in a very pink blanket, and she was pinker than the blanket. And I can still feel tonight the wonder that I felt on that very incredible night in March. And I think it's a feeling that comes over every father with his firstborn. And that is, this is what life is really all about. Let us drink to life old and new, to our dear, beloved firstborn, Linda, to the love of her life, Chuck, and to all the Robs, whose family life will enlarge and enrich our own for every day of the very happy future that I know is going to be ours. And for the very happy tomorrow that we'll all share together.
Dearly beloved, we are gathered together here in the sight of God and in the face of this company to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony, which is an honorable estate instituted of God, signifying unto us the mystical union that is betwixt Christ and his church, which holy estate Christ adorned and beautified with his presence and first miracle that he wrought in Cana of Galilee, and is commended of St. Paul to be honorable among all men, and therefore is not by any to be entered into unadvisedly or lightly, but reverently, discreetly, advisedly, soberly, and in the fear of God. Into this holy estate these two persons present come now to be joined. If any man can show just cause why they may not lawfully be joined together, let him now speak, or else hereafter forever hold his peace. I require and charge you both, as ye will answer at the dreadful day of judgment, when the secrets of all hearts shall be disclosed, that if either of you know any impediment why ye may not be lawfully joined together in matrimony, ye do now confess it. For be ye well assured that if any persons are joined together otherwise than as God's word doth allow, their marriage is not lawful. Charles, wilt thou have this woman to thy wedded wife to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health and forsaking all others, keep thee only unto her, so long as ye both shall live. I will. Linda, wilt thou have this man to thy wedded husband, to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou love him, comfort him, honor and keep him in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others, keep thee only unto him, so long as ye both shall live? Who giveth this woman to be married to this man? Her mother and I. I, Charles, take thee, Linda. I, Charles, take thee, Linda. To my wedded wife. To my wedded wife. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death us do part. Till death us do part. According to God's holy ordinance. According to God's holy ordinance. And thereto I plight thee my troth. And thereto I plight thee my troth. Loose your hands and Linda, you take his right hand now. I, Linda, take thee, Charles. I, Linda, take thee, Charles. To my wedded husband. To my wedded husband. To have and to hold. From this, day forward. from this day forward. For better, for worse. For, for, worse. for, richer, for, poorer. for richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. Sickness and in health. To, love and to, to love and to cherish. Till death us do part. Death us do part. According to God's holy ordinance. 
and thereto I give thee my troth. Bless, O Lord, this ring, that he who gives it and she who wears it may abide in thy peace and continue in thy favor unto their life's end, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Repeat after me. With this ring I thee wed. With this ring I thee wed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Bless, O Lord, this ring, that she who gives it and he who wears it may abide in thy peace and continue in thy favor unto their life's end, through Jesus Christ our Lord. With this ring I thee wed, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O eternal God, creator and preserver of all mankind, giver of all spiritual grace, the author of everlasting life, send thy blessing upon these thy servants, this man and this woman, whom we bless in thy name that they, living faithfully together, may surely perform and keep the vow and covenant betwixt them made, whereof these rings given and received are tokens and pledges, and may ever remain in perfect love and peace together and live according to thy laws through Jesus Christ our Lord. Almighty God, creator of mankind, who only art the wellspring of life, Bestow upon these thy servants, if it be thy will, the gift and heritage of children, and grant that they may see their children brought up in thy faith and fear to the honor and glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. O God, who has so consecrated the state of matrimony that in it is represented the spiritual marriage and unity betwixt Christ and his church, Look mercifully upon these thy servants, that they may love, honor, and cherish each other, and so live together in faithfulness and patience, in wisdom and true godliness, that their home may be a haven of blessing and of peace, through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Will you join your right hands now? Those whom God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Forasmuch as Charles and Linda have consented together in holy wedlock, and have witnessed the same before God and this company, and thereto have given and pledged their troth each to the other, and have declared the same by giving and receiving rings, and by joining hands, I pronounce that they are man and wife, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Will you kneel for the blessing? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, bless, preserve, and keep you. The Lord mercifully with his favor look upon you, and fill you with all spiritual benediction and grace, that ye may so live together in this life 
that in the world to come ye may have life everlasting. Amen. You may kiss your bride. Get your bouquet on. As with all weddings, the great and the small, there were final obligations. The official wedding photograph, congratulations from friends and relatives, and the cake cutting. For the first time, Captain Rob's parents were able to observe their son display his talent as a social aid. Captain Rob, with ease and grace, presented them to the 500 guests, many of whom were already familiar faces at the White House. Nearly a century of White House history was firmly spanned with the presence of Alice Roosevelt Longworth. 61 years earlier, she too was married in the East Room, and attending her wedding, the former Nellie Grant, also married in the East Room in 1874. Captain and Mrs. Robb, it was an unforgettable, glorious day, filled with moments of tenderness. And for this, the most important house in the nation, it was one of those rare, magic events that happen only once in a lifetime. Let us drink to life old and new, to our dear, beloved firstborn, Linda, to the love of her life, Chuck, and to all the Robs, whose family life will enlarge and enrich our own for every day of the very happy future that I know is going to be ours, and for the very happy tomorrow that we'll all share together. <laughs> 